Sorry, I had a question. Okay. I a, um, I can find the lecture for last week online. I'm a little behind on those. I think I, I don't, I don't think I've posted that yet. Okay, just checking. Yeah, um, I'll catch up on that. Sometimes I got it kind of turns into a project of its own, but yeah, I, I don't think I've posted that yet for last week. Anything else? Okay, good. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and um, put up the PDF for tonight. And uh, oops. Okay, thought I had opened that. I guess I didn't. Let's see if I can find the two I need. Maybe it crashed on me. I don't know what happened to that, but <laughs> excuse me. Um, well, let me go ahead and see if I can do it this way. Okay, let's try it like this file. Okay, and then I'll find uh, chapter um, three a little bit later when we get to that. Okay, but I think we had left off at module, the last module, which I think is module nine, right? Um, looking at how information uh the effect of information technology on the audit. And basically, what we're going to be seeing here is certain tools that the auditor will be able to use, um, you know, computerized audit techniques that the auditors will be using, and also a couple of considerations about the entity's uh, information system. So when you take a look and we start to talk about the uh, IT environment, um, you can see as we come down that there is going to be a little bit of a difference in segregation of duties that you would see in a purely manual environment. By that, what we're trying to um, articulate there is that in a manual environment, you would want to separate. Remember, we talked about separating the authorization of a transaction from the record keeping to the actual custody of the asset. Well, computers don't order things for themselves over the internet and then take those things home. So you could combine, say, the authorization and the record keeping, probably not custody because computers don't take custody of things, but you can probably combine the authorization and the record keeping in an IT environment because again, uh, computers don't really, um, you know, <laughs> don't order things for themselves and then want to take them home, right? They're machines. So under that scenario, uh, you really wouldn't, you could maybe combine authorization and record keeping, okay? So you could go ahead and flashcard that. Another consideration when your client is in an IT environment is this notion of the disappearing audit trail, okay? So it costs money to store information on a computer system. You have to have the capacity to store things. And if you have an entity that has a high volume of transactions, well, you don't expect them to pay all that money for that storage. Uh, I was on an audit of the Bureau of Public Debt and the Federal Reserve Bank is the entity that acts as a, a, fiscal, um, a fiscal agent for the federal government. And there are, you know, as you can imagine, millions of transactions that go through the Federal Reserve System. They just don't have the capacity to save every single transaction. So as we were going along, we were asking about the availability of records. They're like, hey, look, guys, if you want that available by the end of the year, you're going to have to work with us to figure out how to store that, et cetera. Okay? So you need to keep that in, pro in mind that if the client processes most of its data electronic form, uh, audit tests should be performed on a continuous basis. Um, and then we're going to see how you could use some of these computer assisted audit techniques that we're talking about in a minute to save off certain transactions that you may want to be able to look at um, later. Now, the exam, as you know, loves to talk about benefits versus risks, rewards versus risks. So let's go ahead and flashcard here some IT benefits 
Okay, these are IT benefits, and I want you to go ahead and flashcard those because the exam likes to ask those questions. And so there is a potential, um, well, that's not IT benefits now, is it? That's IT risk. We'll get to the benefits in a minute. Sorry, guys, I got my wires crossed there. These are IT risks, and they talk about the potential for increased error or irregularity. So you can see that um, the um, opportunity for remote access to data, somebody can hack in remotely into your system. They may be in another country we're learning, right, and hack in uh, to your system somehow. Concentration of information in computerized system. What happens there? Once they break into your system, they're into everything as opposed to having to physically break into one location where certain records are. Decreased human involvement, okay? This can be a real problem in that a transaction seems to be authorized. No human being is actually looking at that. And then the transaction continues to perpetuate with uh, no intervention from a human. Um, there could be error in design or maintenance of programs. So maybe the program uh, design has a flaw and now instead of one transaction having a problem, every transaction has a problem because the program was flawed. And computer disruptions could pro cause problems. And that happens when there's a crash in a system. And depending on the nature of the entity, I was on an assignment where we were looking at corporate credit unions. Corporate credit unions serve as clearing houses for several other smaller credit unions. And one of the corporate credit unions crashed and it not only affected their operations, of course, but it affected the operations of many, many other credit unions and therefore had rippling effect across uh, the credit union community. Uh, so you could have that kind of a problem. Okay, so those are really uh, more IT risks. Uh, IT benefits, okay, which are the ones down here, and really the IT benefit that they're talking about here. Okay, so benefit versus risks, right? The IT benefits, and you can flashcard that, but really, not CF, but C, flashcard that, uh, is that computerized systems provide more opportunity for data analysis and review, and uh, also you can integrate audit procedures using data analytics, et cetera, okay? So you can go ahead and uh, flashcard that, and basically, you know, this is all kind of the same thing, additional data for management reports, et cetera, okay? Okay, good. So IT benefits versus IT risks. Now, what happens? If you have a client that has a highly automated system, okay, then you are going to have a couple of decisions that you may want to make or, or, or A or B decision. One is, you could audit around the computer. If you audit around the computer, you're essentially going to ask the entity to give you the records out of the system so that you can go ahead and audit those records out of that system. So you kind of can turn the thing into a paper audit, okay? So you could do that. More likely though, these days, what you'll do is audit through the computer. And why don't you go ahead and put audit through the computer. They don't call it that as much anymore, but just in case there's something old that talks about that. And basically you're going to use computer assisted audit techniques. And there are five computer assisted audit techniques that we are going to flashcard the definitions for, understand how they work. And um, when I look at these, the names are very descriptive as to how these particular computer assisted audit techniques work. For example, we have transaction tagging. So remember, we said that the uh, transactions are gonna be processed through the system. Well, you can tag a transaction and follow it through the client system to see how that transaction is handled. So you're gonna put a unique tag or mark on a transaction and then follow it through the client system to see that it is uh, being processed correctly. Now, remember we said you could also have the embedded audit module. Well, embedded audit module will automatically save off certain transactions, okay? For example, 
the auditor may want to save transactions that are greater than a certain dollar amount, in this example, $500. So if the client tells you, hey, we capitalize all transactions over $500, over $5,000, whatever the threshold is, then you might put an embedded audit module embedded in there so that it is doing what? It is going to save off in the repairs and maintenance account any transaction that's over that $500, $5,000 threshold, whatever it is. So you can look at it and say, well, why? was this recorded as repairs and maintenance when it exceeded your materiality threshold for capitalizing uh, certain you know, uh, repairs or whatever that are being made. Uh, test data, okay? And let's sort of summarize what happens with the test data versus the integrated test facility. And then we'll look to see uh, what the outline says, okay? But um, what I want you to write here is dummy, auditor data client system offline. Now contrast that to the integrated test facility, which again is dummy auditor data client system online, okay? So what happens when we are using test data? Let's just look at the, what they're saying now. Test data refers to the technique that uses the application program to process a set of test data. That's the dummy data. The results for which are already known. So we're supposedly knowing how the client system should process these fictitious transactions and the client's system is used to process the auditor's data offline while it's still under the auditor's control. So this is done on the weekend or something like that where you would go ahead and process this dummy data using the client system offline and you know how it should process, you know what the answer to that should be, and then you're just testing the client system to see if it runs correctly. Now, with the integrated test facility, which they tell us is similar to the um, test data approach, and now what we do is we use the client system to process the auditor data, but we do it online. We commingle it with live data. Now, when you look at that, you can go ahead and prepare a flashcard that uh, kind of compares the two if you want to difference between test data and uh, integrated test facility. And the answer is one's done online, the other one's done offline. You look at that and you think, well, why would I ever use test data approach when integrated test facility is going to give me a better picture of how the client staff interacts with data that comes through? Well, your client may say, we really don't want to be co-mingling, you know, uh, fake data with real data. We don't want our, our system, our, our operations disrupted, et cetera. And so then you go ahead and you choose test data, and then you're going to have to do some other procedures to see how the client's um, employees, their staff, actually interact with the data. But if you could, you'd want to use integrated test facility. Bottom line, guys, notice the what? Notice the um, how descriptive these titles are. Test data offline integrated. We're integrating the uh, dummy data with the live data. So you can go ahead and if you want to, maybe you can make a comparison flashcard out of that of those two because they are similar. The key difference is doing it offline versus online, right? Okay, now you come over and uh, note also the client's personnel are not informed that the test is being run. It's all about to see if they'll process if their interaction allows the transaction to process correctly. Uh, now, parallel simulation, okay, is going to be um, client data, and you can put actual client data, I guess there, okay, real client data. And here it's auditor system. 
Okay, so now we take the client's data and we take it back to the auditor system, auditor system, and we write a program that is supposed to process the data the way the client system has been described to us and how it processes. And we look to see if our answer is the same as what the client's system came up with. That's called parallel simulation. And notice there that we are really what going to go ahead and compare the client's results using the client's data to what our program says. And again, the names are very descriptive, parallel simulation. We are simulating on a parallel level what it is the client system is supposed to do versus the auditor system, okay? So when you look at these five computer-assisted auto techniques, and I've asked you to flashcard them, but the titles are very descriptive. Transaction tagging, put an electronic tag on a transaction, follow through the client system. Embedded audit module, going to sit there and save off certain transactions. Test data versus integrated test facility. Test data is what dummy auditor data in the client system offline versus integrated dummy auditor data client system online. And the big deal there is seeing how the client's personnel interacts. And then parallel simulation is the real client data being run on the auditor system to see if the auditor system generates the same answer as what the client system came up with. Okay. All right, good. Now you also have generalized audit software packages, and these packages are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, you're probably seeing them if you're taking the data at analytics class now, if you're getting your master's in data analytics and accounting, um, you have a class that's required that's part of that program. Uh, a typical one is a program called IDEA. And what I what software like IDEA allows you to do is you simply ask the client for a file of their information or you ask for access to their system and you go in and you extract out certain data that you want to analyze and then you're able to go ahead and analyze a much larger sample. Or you may even with the speed and the uh, capacity of these generalized audit software packages growing over time, you may be able to do 100% testing on a set of uh, transactions using generalized audit software package. So let's go ahead and look at some of the advantages then of these generalized audit software packages right here at the bottom of the page. And <clears throat> the advantages, you notice the theme guys, when there's advantages being talked about, I typically have a flashcard that because examiners love to ask questions like that. These generalized audit soft pack work packages allow the auditor to test much higher percentage of transactions, which much more reliable uh, audit results. The bigger the sample, the more reliable. And if you do 100% testing, which some of these packages are powerful enough that they do allow you to do that now, then you're not even using sample, okay? Um, the generalized audit software package requires little technical knowledge. Uh, they are typically Windows-based and you don't have to have a lot of technical knowledge of the client's system. You simply ask the client to provide you a file that you're going to run your analysis against, or you may say, hey, uh, we would like you to let us gain access because we're going to use the generalized audit software package to go in and extract certain transactions that we're going to be looking at. And then after initial use, um, you know, and you get better at a software like that, like IDEA, uh, you're going to be saving time going forward as you are learn go through the learning curve and learning how to use that kind of generalized audit software package. Okay, any question about that? Okay, we will talk more about IT and some of the later uh, lectures, but that's a nice high overview of some of the um, different computer assisted audit techniques and uh, the benefits of generalized audit software packages. So with that, let's go ahead and let's take a look at our first set of questions tonight.
Okay, we're coming up on the uh, two minutes. Just about everybody's had a chance to try this one. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look. And um, yeah, we got a 71%. Uh, most of us got this right. And again, if we're talking about what integrated test facility, we're taking the auditor data and we're commingling it with what? With the client data without the client operating personnel being aware of that testing process, we're integrating what? Fictitious and real transactions. I call them dummy auditor data. They're fictitious transactions. And uh, that is a good description of the integrated test facility. Again, just sitting there and what? The idea of fictitious and real transactions being processed together to me, it almost automatically points you to the phrase integrated test facility. And I forgot to share the results with you, but 71% uh, of us got that right. A couple of us wanted C, parallel simulation. No, that's going to be what? That's going to be the client data on the auditor system. Uh, I don't know why anyone would pick D because we did not talk about anything that sounded like D. So. Um, I don't know. Does anyone want to explain why they thought D was correct? Uh, professor, I'm sorry. I, I answered question two instead of one. That was a confusion. Oh. So. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. No problem. Good. So let's see if you got, let's go ahead and let everyone work that one and see if you got that one right. Okay, good. Looks like uh, most of us have had a chance to try this one. And so we take a look and good, we got a good uh, percentage uh, here, 93% of us got this one right. Um, and again, when we talk about parallel simulation, we're talking about the uh, client data being processed on the auditor system and then it's compared to however the client system processed that data. And uh, we hope for the uh, same results, right? And so when we look at this, we look at this question and it says uh, client data on a control program under the auditor's control. So that's going to be what? The auditor's system, that's going to be what? Parallel simulation. Test data was what? Was auditor data on the client system offline, okay? All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's try the next one.
Okay, we're coming up on about two minutes now and uh, just about everyone's had a chance to work this one. So uh, take a look and good results here. Um, most of us, <clears throat> quite a substantial number of us, 86% uh, got the correct answer here, which is A. A um, couple people wanted D for some reason. So be ready, D, or as I'm gonna ask you to justify that here in a second. But we go ahead and we take a look at this and we say the primary advantage of using generalized audit software packages is to audit the financial statements of the client that use an EDP system that the auditor may access information without have, with having limited understanding of the client's hardware and software features. Again, you're probably going to be able to use this a program like IDEA. It's a Windows-based program. You go in and the client gives you access to the system and you're able to act, um, uh, extract certain data that you need for your audit procedure. Um, so I'm curious about D. Was there somewhere in the text that we said something that made you think that D was correct? Yeah, I can go ahead and speak on that. I, and I'm referring to page 79, just page up. And I'm just looking at the bullet points for advantages of using gas. And I do see that the bullet points, and maybe it was just not enough language in that second bullet point. Um, it requires little technical knowledge. Um, I mean, I know you scrolled in client system, but still, it's just, I would have hoped Becker would probably would add that edit in there too. Um, but trust me, I mean, I added it. Okay. <laughs> you don't trust me? But I, I trust see you. <laughs> how, how that second bullet points you to D. Um, I'm actually and also probably looking at the, the third bullet point, um, reducing audit time. So maybe I just picked up the not one key term as well. Reducing audit time, meaning that as we learn the uh, software package, we get through that learning curve, then, um, you know, we are able to quickly extract data and do the procedures we want to in an automated, in an automated um, manner. But I still don't see how that gets you to D, reduce the level required test of controls to, oh, I kind of see that, but, and the reason I'm kind of picking on this question in that the required level uh, of test of controls is predicated on our assessment of control risk. The lower the assessment of control risk, the more evidence you need to support that lower assess level. So D is really kind of um, 
is is an indication that uh, a candidate doesn't understand how test of controls work. Okay, when we look and we assess the uh, risk of material misstatement, if that assessment of the risk of material misstatement is lower, we need more evidence to support that lower assessed level of control risk. In fact, if we assess our control risk at maximum, we don't test any controls. We bypass the testing of the operating effectiveness of the controls. So there's nothing about the manner in which the procedures perform using an EDP system that would reduce the level of required test of controls. What, what um, you know, and then to a relatively small amount is, is just complete nonsense. It's, it's predicated on the assessment of the risk. Duly noted. I just need to go through and read the questions a little bit more yeah. and figure out my puzzle a nation a little <clears throat> bit more concisely. That's why we're here. We're not here to, um, you know, chastise anybody or make anyone feel bad, but I wanted to point out why D is wrong because a couple of folks picked it and the, the thinking that has to go through uh, in determining the amount of control tests that we're going to do. Next time we'll talk about audit sampling and what we'll see that um, as you start to uh, want to increase your confidence level, um, then you're going to have to take larger sample sizes and you probably would increase your confidence level if you're thinking you have um, you know, a lower assessed level of control risk. Okay, good. Uh, that is chapter two. So we are caught up there now. Any other questions? Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and um, get out of that and see if I can find chapter three. I noticed Donald isn't here. Um, I'm assuming that everybody else has received their books at this point. No, still waiting, but I'm a unusual case. Okay, um, I asked this question last week because um, I asked them to uh, follow up on Donald's books. So please send me an email that your books have not come also so that I can ask them to follow up on that. Okay, we'll do, thank you. In Donald's case, they were able to give me a tracking number, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of information that um, we'll open the same file. That's the kind of information that I need to have so that I can um, stay on them about looking things up and rattling cages and whatnot. Okay. However, having said that, um, I believe that I have posted on e-learning chapter three, right? Yes, that was very helpful. Okay. Okay. So that you got that. That's good. Okay. Good. The other thing um, that we're going to be looking at, since I'm opening e-learning anyway, um, I want to draw your attention to this. Um, let me put it in the, It's a little easier for you to see what's going on if I put you put myself in student mode. And. Uh, under chapter two, okay, under chapter two, um, there are these slides that even though I put them under chapter two, we're going to be reviewing those here tonight as well as we go through um, start chapter three. Okay, all right, good. So with all that, let's go ahead and let's get into chapter three and let's start to take a look at uh, some of the point areas and fraud risk. Okay, fraud risk, 10 point area. You have to know this, how to assess fraud risk. Audit risk, 10 point area. Okay, now when we look at this, um, note that we have um, identifying as an uh, audit risk, identifying, assessing, and responding to the risk. Those are really two areas that they just broke down into two modules because they have this annoying thing of wanting to um, you know, put things in bite-sized modules, whatever. 
Um, so that's fine. But then we come to specific areas of engagement risk, okay? And I don't know that I like this heading, okay? Because in here, we have a couple of different um, things that we look at. One is auditing. Let me turn the color. That's, that is not a good color for uh, on top of orange. Except I'm not going to be able to change it without going into full screen mode. I'm sure there is a way to do it, but I can't figure it out right here. Okay, here we go. So what do we do? Uh, let's just do black. Okay. So um, we're going to look at uh, auditing estimates. We're going to start to talk about, really, both of these we're starting to talk about them because they come up again later, but auditing um, uh, contingencies. And then we talk about um, related party transactions. Okay, that says related party transactions. I can't squeeze it in there because I don't know how to judge the amount of space I need to write something. Related party transactions. Okay, and when you look at these, these are probably all maybe a good three point area. Okay. Um, it's a little annoying because they start the discussion here and then they complete the discussion in another chapter. But just to give you a sense of some of the areas that are covered there, uh, appropriate audit evidence, guys, maybe about three points. Okay, they go through and they babble a bit there, uh, including procedures to obtain evidence. They tend to babble a little bit in there. Financial ratios, I'm going to ask you to review on your own. I'll show you that module here before we end tonight. I don't like to sit here and just read off ratios to you, but I'll show you uh, what I want you to do with that. Uh, audit sampling, we won't get into until next time. That's about a five point area. And audit data analytics, which is a growing part of the exam, but that's gonna be about five points. We'll get to that um, next time as well. Okay, so with all that as a sense of point values, and you can see what assessing risk is a big, big part of the exam. I mean, that's what, that's 20 points right there, okay? And it is pervasive because as you assess the risk, that determines then the timing, extent, and nature of your further audit procedures. And so uh, you need to understand how to uh, assess the risk and then respond to the risk, okay? now. Fraud risk really is a subset of audit risk, okay? So I think they have kind of flipped this, uh, unfortunately. And so what we're going to do is we are going to, and I guess I'm going to have to go into full screen mode. I don't want to yet, but it looks like they're going to force me to go into full screen mode and uh, come over here. And what I want to do Okay, is I want to jump us to module two. We will come back, obviously, to talk about fraud risk here a little bit later, since it is also a 10 point area. But I want to start with the notion of audit risk and then leverage from that to understand what we're doing with fraud risk, which is a piece of the overall uh, audit risk. So I don't know why they flipped those, I don't know what they were thinking, but we're going to go ahead. And we're going to go through module two first, then we'll go back to module. Well, actually, we can go module two and three, then we'll go back to module one. Okay. But before we do that, okay, and that's why I was trying to avoid going into full screen, I want to come over and I want to review these slides with you. Now, guys, I've gone through these slides with you now two, two times, I think. This is going to be our third time. I'm going to keep referring back to them. So I think you can understand now, having seen how fraud risk is, I mean, uh, audit risk is a major part of the exam, why I keep harping on this. So if you haven't downloaded these slides, 
and looked at them from e-learning, it's time for you to do that, okay? Make sure you do that, okay? So what happens? When we do our risk assessment procedures, we can consider that step one in our overall look at our uh, assessment of risk, okay? Now, risk assessment procedures can also be called obtaining an understanding phase. We've seen that, okay? And we need to understand some key words here that I have bolded, which is during the risk assessment procedures, we obtain an understanding of the entity, including its environment and its internal control, sufficient to allow us to evaluate key words that we talked about last time, the design of the control, and whether the control is being implemented. Okay, design means what we said last time, is the control even capable of detecting, preventing, and misstating? Implementation means, is it being used? Okay, and uh, remember we said that when we're looking to see if a control has been implemented, we'll do a walkthrough probably in one day that we select to see if indeed the transaction is being implemented, okay? Based on our evaluation of the design and seeing that the control has been implemented, and we always have to do this on every audit, then we will make an assessment of the risk of material misstatement, okay? So that's why I give you that silly mnemonic up there, design, implementation, assessment of risk. What risk are we assessing? We're assessing the risk that there'll be a material misstatement in the financial statement. So it would be dire if you forgot those key steps there, or those key elements, I should say, I guess, of step one, okay? Now, in step one, if we assess the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, we will not, when we go to our further audit procedures on step two, on the next slide, and our further audit procedures also called the test of details phase, we will bypass the testing of the operating effectiveness of the controls, and we will go directly to our substantive testing. And we're going to do the maximum of our substantive testing, nature, extent, timing, nature, we're going to use external evidence instead of internal evidence, extent, larger sample sizes for our substantive testing, and we will be doing our testing at year end as opposed to interim. And conversely, if in step one in the obtaining and understanding phase, we had assessed the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum, which means we must have felt the design was sufficient and we saw that it was implemented, we can assess the risk of material status at less than the maximum. So then when we move to what uh, step two, further audit procedures, the uh, test of details phase, we will first, and we follow that black arrow, we will first test the operating effectiveness of the controls keyword, okay? When you're going through and you're testing the operating effectiveness, you're taking a sample of transactions, and depending on how low that risk is, as I was just mentioning, that sample will be higher if the risk of material misstatement, um, excuse me, if your control risk, you have assessed at a lower amount, larger sample size, if you assess the uh, control risk at a higher amount, but less than the maximum, smaller sample size. And then if you go all the way to assessing the risk of material, the, the control risk at the maximum, then you don't even test the operating effectiveness, right? Okay, but we're going to test the operating effectiveness. We have assessed it at less than the maximum. We first do that. And then we always have to do some degree of substantive testing, but now nature, extent, timing, nature, Maybe we can use internal evidence instead of external evidence for our substantive procedures, extend probably smaller sample sizes for my substantive testing. And now I could probably do some interim testing instead of year end. So this was sort of the key word slides that we talked about last time. And then I also had these little uh, graphics here that said, hey, look, your audit risk is a combination of your assessment of your inherent risk and your control risk times your detection risk, okay? Now, when we look at inherent risk and control risk, we consider those together to be the risk of material misstatement, okay? So you'll assess, you'll assess your inherent risk. Inherent risk, 
the more complex the transaction, the um, you know, the more susceptible uh, asset is, let's say, to theft or something, the higher the inherent risk. The what? The less complex, the less subject to some sort of theft, like we're talking about fixed assets, the lower the inherent risk, right? So we go ahead and we assess that risk, but then we look for controls that will prevent or detect the misstatement affecting the assertion that we are looking at for that particular account, okay? So we go ahead and we make the assessment of our control risk and our inherent risk together. And if in this example, remember we had the jewelry shop that didn't have very good controls, then what? Then we assess both of those at the maximum since we want our audit risk to be low. And I put a 0 0.05 audit risk here indicating that that's a low. I only want a 5% chance that I will incorrectly give what? An unqualified, unmodified opinion when in fact I should have qualified or adverse or something like that, right? Okay, so I want a low chance of that. So to keep that chance low, since I've assessed the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, to lower my audit risk, I have to lower my detection risk. And the way I lower my detection risk is through my substantive procedures. So I put my substantive procedures up here. And by up, again, meaning nature, extent, timing, nature, I'm going to use external evidence instead of internal evidence, extent, larger sample sizes, timing. I'm going to probably do year end testing. And I drew that little picture there. And that if there is a high risk of material misstatement, probably because my controls aren't very good and I have accounts with high inherent risk. So a bunch of misstatements are hitting the financial statements. So I don't have the luxury of doing my testing in interim and then praying that it doesn't continue to rain hard to the back end of the year. So I do my testing at the end of the year to sit there and make sure that I have squeegeed off all those errors that have uh, been encountered during the year. Now, if I'm sitting here and I'm in the situation where my um, risk of material misstatement is lower. And in this case, since we were dealing with the jewelry shop, you know, you can't really change the inherent risk. It is what it is, right? The factors that lead to that assessment, what are you going to do? It's cash, it's cash, right? But now we sit here and we looked at the controls and they had all these different things coming on, dual custody of assets and combinations and cameras and all that kind of stuff and control sheets for the inventory for that example we talked about last time. So what happens? Now my control risk comes down. I still want my audit risk to be low, but because I'm now relying on those controls, I can accept a little higher detection risk. So now I put that detection risk a little higher from 0.05 to 0.10. That keeps my audit risk at 0.05 because I have a lower control risk, but I would still have to have gone through the process, right? To determine that those controls have been implemented. And if they weren't implemented, you know, I like to design, then I'd go back up to the maximum for my assessment of control risk. But assuming that the walkthrough worked, and the controls have been implemented. Now I will test the operating effectiveness and I'll employ sample of transactions. And if I'm trying to get that risk as low as possible, that control risk, and I want to support that low assessed level control risk, more control testing. Okay. But if the what control risk starts to go up, nah, maybe I don't have to test as many because I'm not uh, relying as much on that control. And again, if my control is in maximum, I don't test any controls, right? Okay. So what happens? I sit here, I test the operating effectiveness, that testing operating effectiveness works. If I look and the testing and operating effectiveness doesn't work, I don't see evidence that it had operating effect is zoop, I'm back up to the maximum. I'm back up to the previous slide, the previous example. But assuming my testing of operating effectiveness works as part of my further audit procedures in step two, now my what? My detection risk can be a little higher, meaning my substantive testing can come down. That means nature, extent, timing, nature. I can use internal evidence instead of external evidence, extent smaller sample sizes for my substantive testing. And now I can probably afford some interim testing. I'll do my testing at say 
September uh, 30th in this example, assuming a 1231 year end. For that last quarter, though, I will have to do some smaller amount of testing, maybe analytical procedures or something like that. We call that part a roll forward just to make sure that things haven't gone to hell in a handbasket between when we did our interim testing at 930 and by the time we get to year end. Okay. That was what we talked about uh, last time. I'm repeating it here because it is critical. And what we're going to do now is go through the textbook and see where these same elements are addressed in module two here uh, and module three as we go through uh, the textbook. Um, any question about that so far? Okay, one more thing to keep in mind here, guys, is that as we go through and we do these assessments, we're doing them by assertion. We are doing these assessments by assertion. So you may talk about the account here, cash being more, uh, having a higher inherent risk than say property, plant, equipment, but then some assertions have more inherent risk associated with them than others. So it's not just the account, you're doing this by assertion. So I have this little example where we sit here and we have our particular account, we're looking at sales. When you audit one account, say the credit of sales, well, double entry bookkeeping, there's going to be a debit and often the debit associated with sales is what, is going to be account receivable. So you're saying, well, I can get some audit coverage for my sales by automatic account receivable and vice versa. Now you look at the assertion. Remember we had six assertions, existence, occurrence, completeness, rights and obligations, valuation, allocation, presentation, uh, and disclosure and understandability, right? So we have these six assertions that we're looking at. And when we look at those uh, assertions, uh, we want to see we want to ask ourselves, what is the potential misstatement in the assertion? So when we talk about existence, okay, the potential misstatement is that a transaction is recorded, but it never occurred. Or maybe there was a sales return and they didn't record the return. So we then look at the controls and we look at the controls that are designed that should be implemented to prevent or detect the misstatement in that assertion. So in this particular case, the client tells us, well, we follow up with the customer. We call them and ask them, did you like the goods? And so if they never got the goods at that point, they'd say, what goods? The problem we have with the way this one was designed, it's the same person that made the sale calls back. Well, we don't like that. We want what? We, that person, there's not good separation of duty. We want separation of duty because that person that made the sale saying they made the sale, maybe he's trying to get a bigger commission or something. So when we evaluate, when we you know, obtain the understanding phase and we assess our control risk, okay, assessing the potential misstatement is looking at the inherent risk. But when we assess our control risk now, notice here we said, we don't like this, poor separation of dues. Okay, so we bypass during our uh, testing phase, we bypass in our further audit procedures, we bypass the testing, of the operating effectiveness of the controls and we move directly to substantive testing. We take a big old sample and we look at all kinds of different things here and send out confirmations and stratify and everything else to get that detection risk down, right? These examples are mutually exclusive if you were sitting there and still be the potential misstatement and whatnot. We look for control and now they've got separation of duty, they got follow-up, they got the internal auditors involved. So now we assess our risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum, okay? We did our walkthroughs. We see that they are doing a good job and whatnot with the implementation. So now we have to do what? In our testing phase now, yes, we will test operating effectiveness. And then assuming the testing operating effectiveness works, we can lower our assessment of control risk. I mean, um, we have a lower assessment of control risk, but we can lower the nature, extent, and timing of our substantive procedures. Okay, now a very important part of being able to test the operating effectiveness is that there's some documentation available for us to look at to run our testing, our control testing, the testing of the operating effectiveness. And in this example, I think I had call logs that were signed off on. And then the internal auditors kept those reports, kept those call logs, and then they, you know, periodically reported back to the board of directors. Okay, 
question about any of that. That is the thought process. Okay, so is let's there just... a flow chart for the thought process? Yeah, it's right here. I mean, like, um, I think you had used the different shaping diagrams. I just asked because that type of visualization visualization helps me a little bit better. Well, this is a flow chart. This is a flow chart. This is a flow chart. Okay, maybe There's I'm just pointing I'm to where you go. This is a flow chart. Step one, risk assessment and procedures, obtain an understanding to evaluate the design of the control and determine if they've been implemented, make an assessment of the risk of the maximum. I mean, make assessment of risk of material misstatement. If it's at the maximum, follow the flow chart arrow to the red and go directly to substantive testing. If it is less than the maximum, follow the black arrow and first test the operating effectiveness. And then where are we that one now? The second slide. Test first test the operating effectiveness. And then so this is a flow chart. Okay. I'll just I'll just not accept it. Oh no, I'll just probably need to sit down and sleep on sleep on it a little bit more. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure what you're wanting, Cheryl. I mean, I'm giving you uh, the steps. I'm telling you step one and step two, and then you're asking me for a flow chart. Sorry, I just, I, just sure process things little, I just process things a little differently. That's all. Okay. Well, this is how I teach it. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> There's still time to, to get out of the class, isn't there? <laughs> it's not working for you because this is how it's going to work. I mean, I'm going to show you the ways I think that it is necessary for you to be successful in understanding this stuff. Um, so imagining that there's something else somewhere that's going to be uh, something else, it ain't coming. Okay. Okay, good. So we come over and we take a look at now the textbook. Okay, and we start to take a look at our um, audit risk. Okay, now audit risk, and we've seen how that is, you know, mathematically determined uh, using the inherent risk times the control risk times the detection risk. But let's see what we think uh, audit risk is. So audit risk is the risk that the auditor will unknowingly fail to appropriately modify the opinion on financial statements that are materially misstated. So there's a material misstatement. We should qualify, we should adverse. Instead, we give an unmodified, unqualified opinion. That's our audit risk, okay? Now, when we say, well, what are misstatements, okay? And misstatements, okay, can be factual misstatement. Something for which there is absolutely no doubt is a factual misstatement. So go ahead and flashcard the types of misstatements. Okay, there's factual misstatements. So what happens there? I am trying to test the existence, assertion over sales, accounts receivable. I want external evidence. So what do I do? I send a confirmation to my client's customer saying, do you owe $25,000? The client's customer comes back and says, no, I paid that. Okay, we follow up with the client. The client says, oops, yeah, we should have credited the account receivable debit and cash. We forgot to do that, whatever. So that means there is what? A factual misstatement, okay? Now that is contrasted, okay, we're gonna flashcard all of these. You can just put them on your own flashcard with judgmental misstatements. They are differences arising from the judgments of management and the auditor, for example, we look and we see that the client estimates that a piece of equipment has a 20 year life. We look at that piece of equipment and we're like, you'd be lucky to get five years out of this. Now who's right? Maybe management is right. Maybe the auditor is right. The auditor is gonna ultimately need to go with what? With their judgment. So we may say, hey, they're not depreciating that correctly. Where's a misstatement. We may ask them to, um, you know, modify the financial statements, or we might have to change our opinion from unqualified, unmodified to some sort of qualification. 
Protect, uh, projected misstatements are basically when we use an audit sample and we go ahead and we project that sample to the population, but there's always a chance that what the sample will be different than the population. And so uh, we would have a projected misstatement, but there's always a chance that there could be a difference there. These are the types of misstatement, and you can go ahead and flashcard those. Okay. Now you come over and we take a look, and we've already seen this now in the slide that I gave you. Audit risk is equal to the risk of material misstatement times the detection risk, right? Now, when we talk about the risk of material misstatement, we have seen that that is the interaction between the inherent risk and the control risk. And so let's understand the elements of the risk of material misstatement a little bit more, just seeing where it is in the textbook. Inherent risk is the risk of the susceptibility to a relevant assertion, assuming there are no related controls. So I kind of always call this the pit bull, right? Pit bull is barking. Right? And if there's no control, there's no leash, the pit bull can just attack at will on the financial statements, whatever. And if you have a pit bull, I'm not trying to disparage pit bulls, I'm just trying to create a visual, okay? And so what happens? The more complex the transaction, the higher the inherent risk, okay? If we're talking about cash, then we're going to consider it to have a higher inherent risk, okay? If there's technology involved, that could increase our inherent risk. Now here, they start calling out things that would increase inherent risk. What might lower inherent risk is if something is not necessarily susceptible to theft, let's say. Property plant and equipment tends to have a lower inherent risk because it's kind of hard to sneak off with some sort of fixed asset in the middle of the night, right? So it goes both ways in terms of the assessment, even though here we're talking about things that would drive up the inherent and the inherent risk make it higher. Okay. Um, one second. Open sunshine coming in anymore. Okay. All right, good. Now you come over, and that's our inherent risk. When we look at control risk, control risk is the risk that the control will not be effective in um preventing or detecting a misstatement on a timely basis. My entity and internal control won't do that. And again, that one example where we said, hey, look, during the obtaining the understanding phase, we looked at the design and we didn't like the segregation of duties. Uh, we did a walkthrough. People tried to do the control, didn't seem to understand what they were doing. They didn't like the design. It wasn't implemented. So we are going to assess the control risk high because we don't think it'll be better detecting the statement. Conversely, you could look and say, hey, not bad. The controls are pretty good. And then you'd be able to assess that control risk a little bit uh, lower. Now, you come over and let's talk about detection risk. Okay, And detection risk is the risk that the auditor will fail to detect the misstatement in the assertion that we're looking at. So we do our procedure. And our procedure doesn't catch the mistake. Okay, now detection risk is the function of the effectiveness of the audit procedure and the manner in which it was applied. Now, some things that affect detection risk one is because we are not looking at 100% of the transactions in many cases. If we use a sample, there's always a chance that the sample results will be different from the actual. Um, condition of the population. So if that's the case, hey, what are you going to do? You can always have some detection risk. You're just unlucky. Your sample was not representative. Okay. When we look at our detection risk, the detection risk can be broken into two types of uh, not detection risk, but our substantive testing, which is used to lower our detection risk, can be broken into two types. One is a test of details. And for most assertions, most accounts, most of our substantive testing, which is how we lower our detection risk. Okay, most of our substantive testing will be a test of details. In other words, 
confirm accounts receivable is a good example of a test of details here. Okay, it's a good example of a test of details because we're sending out confirmations and whatnot to a sample of our clients' customers. Okay, conversely, okay, some accounts, some assertions lend themselves better to substantive analytical procedures. So I'm just going to put analytical procedures, ARP, analytical review procedures. For example, if we're auditing a laundromat and people are just coming in and dumping change into a machine, well, you're not going to be able to really do a test of details there. So you might do an analytical procedure. So the standards allow for both because some assertions don't lend themselves very well to a test of details, okay? So you can go ahead and flashcard both of those points and then come up and let's just take a look at this pass key. And they tell us inherent risk and control risk exist independently of the audit, okay? What I want you to put here is factors used to assess inherent risk and control risk, okay? The factors used to assess by factors or elements or whatever, what I mean there is that, you know, whatever the inherent risk is associated with cash, I can't change that, okay? I can change my assessment, but I can't change the factors that lead to the assessment. Control risk, if the client has poor controls, I can't change that fact. Now I can change my assessment, Let's say they describe the controls and I'm like, these controls aren't, don't have a good design or they're not implemented. And so I assess my control risk at the maximum. And then I learn a little bit more and I understand, oh, wait, they do have a better design or there's something I didn't understand about the design. Then I can change that assessment. But the factors that lead to the assessment cannot change. So they say the auditor generally cannot change these risks, they really mean you can't change the factors that lead to the assessment. Because then they start arguing with themselves here and they say, however, the auditor can change his or her assessment of these risks as the audit progresses. If you learn new factors, then yeah, you might change that, okay? So the auditor can change your assessment, but you can't change the factors that lead to the assessment. The auditor can always change their detection risk depending on how much risk they're willing to accept, okay? So if my audit risk is supposed to be 0.05, okay? And I'm thinking that my inherent risk is what? Is one, my control risk is one. That means that what? That means that my detection risk is going to have to be at 0 0.05 to keep my audit risk at 0 0.05. But let's say eh, I'm not as a conservative as an auditor. I'm willing to take on a little more risk instead of wanting to be, you know, 95% uh, confident in my audit opinion. I'm willing to be only 90% confident. Well, if that's the case, now my audit risk can be 0 0.10, and therefore my detection risk can be what? 0 0.10. And that has to do more with the auditor's appetite risk aversion for risk than uh, any you know, specific standard or something. The auditor's judgment and what they want to accept as risk can alter the amount of detection risk. The factors that lead to the assessments, I can't change. I can change my assessment if I learn new facts, but I can't change the factors that lead to the assessment. Question on that? Okay, good. Now, they tell us down here that there is an inverse relationship, okay? There's an inverse relationship to um, my risk of material misstatement and my detection risk. So what happens? As my... Um, RMM comes up, okay, my IR times my CR are up, okay, what has to come down? That's a question. Detection risk? Good, thank you, Michael. Yeah, my detection risk got to come down. 
how do I lower my detection risk? How can I lower my detection risk? Increase the sample. Okay, well, that's a partially correct answer. My substantive testing. will be up, and by that, we mean nature. What type of evidence? External or internal? You would use external, right? Yeah, external evidence tends to be more reliable, right? I have a direct communication from some party external to the auditor, right? Okay, good. Now, the point that was made about sample, okay, so what, larger sample sizes? Okay, timing, when am I doing my audit procedure? Year end. Year end, good, okay. Conversely, they tell us what? When risk of material misstatement is lower, then we can uh, justify a higher detection risk. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's just draw it since we're in a drawing mode here. Okay, and so what happens now? My RMM is down. My RMM is down. That's my IR times my CR. Meaning that what? My detection risk, I don't know if it's going to go up that high, but it can be higher, meaning that what my substantive testing can come down. Nature, what? Internal evidence, right? Extent. Smaller samples, right timing down here. Timing what? Interim. Good, okay. All right, so that's the thought process, okay? And again, they tell us that what? The auditor controls the detection risk, okay? So the auditor can change the nature of a substantive test from a less effective to more effective procedure, okay? For example, parties outside, okay? Uh, to, and, uh, to ensure a low level of detection risk. So everything that's here is talking about how to lower detection risk. And you saw from the little chart I drew up there, drawing I did up there, it works the inverse. If you're willing to accept a higher detection risk, change the extent of your substantive test using a larger sample size. So what's down here is really dealing with that red example. Change the timing, what, from, um, from interim to uh, year end. Um, again, these are all done to lower detection risk. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and flashcard what you do to lower detection risks. It's right here. But I've also given you that graphic where I put that and I've given you this so you can kind of use this to help you to do the inverse flashcard what would be done if the auditor is willing to increase detection risk okay okay good and as we've said substantives procedures are always required right you always have to do substantive procedures and they give us the audit risk formula there. And I don't know why they start deriving it and dividing it. I think they got a little full of themselves there where they started to kind of just playing mathematic games with this, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and when we look at our audit risk, we also need to consider materiality. Okay, so remember, it's not only looking at the assertion associated with the account, but it's also understanding, well, how material is this item to the overall financial statement materiality? And then, of course, we lower that for our performance materiality. So obviously, the larger 
the account balance, the more audit scrutiny it's going to get. And then we start to assess risks associated with that account balance and the assertions uh, embedded in that account balance. Okay, so you really have to consider both audit risk and materiality together in determining the timing, extent, and nature of your audit procedure. So flashcard that there is an inverse relationship between audit risk and materiality. Okay, and flashcard that, but let's talk about that for a second because sometimes that's a little counterintuitive for students. So what happens? Let's say I am looking at an audit and I tell you that a two cent error is material. A two cent error in the financial statements would change a person's decision as to whether or not to buy, say, a stock okay, in this entity. Do you think your materiality level is low or high there? Low. You have a very low materiality level. So are you going to want to have larger sample sizes? Do more year-end testing and, um, you know, get more external evidence to help you with that audit? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I would say don't even take that audit, <laughs> okay, because you can sit there all day and you're trying to find a needle in a haystack at two cent error, okay? Now, let's say I tell you that the client has assets of 150000 and I tell you that, um, you know, the materiality level is 90000 is one hundred and 49,000. Do you think you're going to have to look as hard for a material misstatement? No. Right? In fact, if the materiality level was, of course, it would be ridiculous, but if it was 150,000, you don't even have to do any audit work because there's no way there can be a material misstatement, right? Okay. So your sample sizes can be much smaller. So inverse relationship between materiality and your audit risk. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at a couple questions. Okay, good. Looks like uh, everyone has had a chance to um, try this one, and looks like it's 100% because I guess I beat that point into the ground uh, during the discussion here. The problem that I have with this question is they say inherent risk and control risk exist independently from the financial statement audit. The factors that lead to the assessment exist independently, okay, and, uh, whereas detection risk the auditor can change that around if they're willing to accept more risk, right? But the factors that lead to assessment, this is a horribly written question. Um, but um, 
Becker seems to be in love with this question. I guess they think somehow the examiner is going to ask it again or something. I don't know, but um, it should be written better in my opinion. Okay. Now, having said that, let's look at this next question, which to me is the kind of question you will absolutely see on your exam, not only in the form of a multiple choice question like you see here, but there will be task-based simulation in which they're going to describe a scenario to you and see if you can understand how that affects the inherent risk, control risk, detection risk, and then how the auditor might respond to those different assessments. And you'll see that in some of your simulations in chapter three um, when you're doing your homework this week. So let's go ahead though, and let's try this question here together. Not together, you're, you're, you're gonna do it by yourself, but let's do it here. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Um, and we had a pretty good turnout here, 93%. I was kind of hoping for 100% on this one because this is uh, critical. I mean, you're going to see uh, stuff like this on your exam. So the answer here is B, but let's just go ahead and talk through this one, okay? And um, so when we look, they tell us that the, um, on the basis of audit evidence gathered and evaluated, the auditor decided to increase the assessed risk of material misstatement. Now, when I read that, I'm thinking that in step one, the auditor must have done what? Must have attained an understanding of the entity's environment and their internal control to evaluate the design. And they must have done a walkthrough to see that it was implemented. And based on that, okay, they must have assessed the RMM at a lower, at less than maximum, is a better way to say that. And based on that, they said, okay, that means that I can accept a little more what? Detection risk. So my substantive testing can be down. Okay. Now, uh, what happened was the auditor, if you assess the RMM at less than the maximum, what does that mean you have to do? If in the obtaining the understanding phase, you assess the risk of material misstatement in step one, 
which I call step one. The examiners don't call it step one. I call it step one. If it's step one during the obtaining and understanding phase, right, during the um, risk assessment procedures, you assess the risk at less than the maximum, what does that mean you're going to have to do? Test the effectiveness of operating controls. Test the operating effectiveness of the internal controls, yes. Okay, so I'm going to test the operating effectiveness. And Michael, what happens if when I test the operating effectiveness, I look at those um, inventory control sheets, or maybe I'm testing controls over payroll, and I pull a sample of time cards and I look and I see that the supervisor didn't sign off on the time cards. Does that control have operating effectiveness? No. No. So based on that, I'm going to say, you know what? The actual, you know, the assessment that I'm going to do now is I'm going to do what? I'm going to assess the risk of material misstatement at the maximum. And if I do that, now I have to do what? Now I have to, to keep my audit risk the same, I have to lower my detection risk. And in order to lower my detection risk, my substantive testing has to go up. And now they're just being very, you know, broad here in what they're describing. They say that what uh, the auditor is going to, uh, to achieve the overall risk of the the same, the auditor is going to have to do what? decrease detection risk by doing what? Increasing substantive testing, not decreasing substantive testing. So it's the opposite. And don't ask me to under, to explain C and D to you because they're complete nonsense as it relates to this question. Nobody picked it. Question. I was just going to point out that besides all the, you know, answer if you look at the other choices, they are kind of ridiculous things for an auditor to do regardless. Yeah, well, I don't even understand. Yeah, this would be not, to me, this would be nonsense. I mean, what, what are we doing here? So I, I just look at these as complete on, nonsense. And A, Eric, is the opposite of what we're supposed to do, right? I mean, you will adjust your substantive testing, but not down, you're going to adjust it what? Up, right? And I just don't see and D seem a little it's just nonsense. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead. Let's take the break. We are going to continue on with module three. And I think after we do module three, I think that's how I had it uh, contemplated. We'll go back and do module one, okay? And then we'll just pick up from there. Okay, all right, guys. So uh, then we'll come back to module four after we finish module three, uh, after we finish module one, I should say. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's take the break. I'm showing 635. So let's shoot for what, 646, I guess, thereabouts, since we're already into 635. And we will come back and pick up module three. I guess this time I will remember to pause the recording, resume the recording. And uh, as we get into module three now, we're continuing the process of talking about the assessment of the risk of material misstatement and then how we're going to respond to that assessment. Now, as we go through, as we've gone through and we talked about responding, now we are in our what? Our further audit procedures, right? We're in step two. We assess the risk in step one. Step two, we're now to our further audit procedures. So what we're going to talk about here is how we'll respond. And when we respond, we respond at a general level, but we also respond at an assertion level. And we're going to see that we will respond through our testing of the controls, assuming we could assess the control risk at less than the maximum, and then always moving to our substantive procedures. So we start to look down at that response and start to come over and just come over and jump to the uh, uh, second page here. And we talk about assessing specific risk. Okay, and let's just look at that. And we say for each identified risk, the auditor should consider what could go wrong at the assertion level 
And that means that the auditor is considering the likelihood of a potential misstatement. So what happens? You go over, and if that terminology sounds familiar to you, it should, because what we're doing is we're looking and we're saying, well, look, we've made our assessment and um, we made that assessment by considering, where are we? Right here, by considering what the potential misstatement would be. And now we're gonna evaluate that risk and see to what extent the controls will mitigate, prevent, detect that risk, making that assessment and then responding accordingly at the assertion level by deciding whether we're gonna test the controls and then by always doing some measure of our uh, substantive testing. So when you come back now and you take a look at the text, let's see how they start to tell us how we respond to that assessment. Now, what I want to do um, is flashcard here, okay? It's what required documentation we have to do for our assessment of our risk of material misstatement, okay? So we would have had a discussion amongst the audit team about the risk assessment, any decisions that were made, we need to document that. Key elements of the understanding of the controls, okay? So what do we do to understand the controls because that's part of that process, okay? And then the assessment of the risk of material misstatement, both at the financial statement and the relevant assertion, and basis for the assessment, and then identified risk and related controls evaluated by the auditor. Can you think of a documentation that we maybe have uh, contemplated here that might meet these documentation requirements, at least uh, two, three, you know, the last three here? Is there any kind of documentation? template. Would that be in the audit plan? Well, it's probably going to be more of a work paper. The audit plan is basically talking about what it is we're going to be doing and talks about different procedures. So yeah, I guess it could be an audit plan, but I'm talking about a, a specific work paper that you might document that you did these things. What were the elements of the understanding? What was the assessment of risks? at the assertion level, and then what were the controls that were identified and evaluated by the auditor? Would you do like a flow chart for the first one? Well, I guess I'm thinking, and um, you could sit there I meant the second one, sorry. Yeah, and say, maybe that's what you're thinking, say, here's the assertion, right? Here's the, account, here's the assertion, here's the potential misstatement, here's the control technique, here's my evaluation of it, here's how I've responded. And then you can literally, what? Provide a work paper index that will go further and say, well, this is where I did these control tests this is where I did these substantive tests so that someone can follow and see how you responded and what work you did and respond to these assessments. But the assessment is being shown right here, isn't it? What you did, what you understood, what were the controls you identified, how you assessed them, how that affected your assessment control risk. And then the back part of this thing, the blue highlighting up there is how you responded, right? Okay. So, those are the key things that would be documented anyway in a flashcard. I don't know that you would necessarily choose to um, flashcard, I mean, not flashcard, but document them that way, but do document, do flashcard what needs to be documented. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at the uh, next page. And let's see now the response part, which is sort of that back end, okay? Now, <clears throat> when you respond, you respond at both what? At both an overall level and then at an assertion level, okay? So when you respond at a overall level, okay, you're going to make determinations of 
um, you know, communicate with the staff about professional skepticism, you're going to expire, experience what? More experienced uh, skills, those will be possessed more experience if what? If my risk of material misstatement is up, then I'm going to want more experience. If I have a risk of material misstatement that is lower, then maybe I don't have to use as seasoned staff, right? Increased level of supervis supervision. If I think there's a high risk of material misstatement, well, now I'm going to want to visit that site more. If it's lower, I don't have to visit that site as much. Okay, incorporate greater level of unpredictability to the procedures. Um, more pervasive changes to the nature, extent, and timing, okay? So this of your audit procedures. So this is at a very high level, at a general level, I guess, to use the technical term here that they're using, um, that you would respond. But you also have to do what? You have to respond at the assertion level, okay? So the auditor should design procedures that address the risk of material misstatement for each relevant assertion the linkage should be clear between the assessed level of risk at the assertion level and the nature, extent, and timing of the audit procedures. Hmm. Can you think of a document that does that? That sits there and says, here's the assessment. Here's how I responded at the assertion level. And I'm going to bother you with this thing again. Maybe I'm in love with my own work here. But that's basically what we did here. We made the assessment, and it is a clear linkage as to how we responded at the assertion level, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look back at the textbook. And when you respond, you respond through your control testing, but for your substantive testing, you will respond through your nature, extent, in timing, I'm just putting those in there, okay? Whereas what nature means that we are looking at what higher assessed risk of material misstatement, we need more reliable evidence, such as external evidence. Extent basically is the sample sizes to be used. Timing means that we would perform the test at interim or at year end, period end. You know that. Okay, now you come down and they tell us that we could take a purely substantive approach, meaning we will not test the operating effectiveness of the controls. And that's the case if we don't think the controls are effective or what if the implemented controls are assessed as ineffective. So we don't like the design, we don't like the implementation, right? They also say that you could move directly to substantive testing if you believe that it would be more, um, it would not be efficient to test the operating effectiveness. Now, flashcard that because we haven't really talked about that as a reason not to test what we did a little bit last time is to not test the operating effectiveness. And I'm telling you guys that yellow. You see that a lot, and I hear students throw that around a lot as though that happens every day. That is not generally the case, because if you're sitting there and you have evaluated the design of the controls, you've seen that they've been implemented, and you think that now I can just do somewhat internal control testing, which means I'm going to do what? Be using obviously internal evidence for that control testing, and then when I move to my required substantive testing, I can use what? Internal evidence. I can do my testing at interim and I can use smaller sample sizes for my substantive testing. It's highly unlikely that you're going to not do that and now start moving to an approach where you're going to have to be using external evidence, larger sample sizes and doing year end testing. That is rarely more efficient. But if you find yourself in that sort of environment, they give us the option of saying, even though I think the assessment of risk material is less than the maximum, I'm going to go straight to the substantive testing. If you believe it is more efficient, they do allow that. Question. Again, I think that's rare, but okay, the standards allow for that. Okay, good. And so we're responding. We're responding at the assertion level. We could do a purely substantive approach, as we mentioned, if we think the controls are ineffective. 
generally we're hoping for a combined approach and that means that if we think the controls are operating effectively we will test the operating effectiveness of those controls and that will then determine the timing extent and nature of my substantive procedures external evidence etc okay now they tell us that there are circumstances where you may find yourself on an audit in which you think you are going to have to do some control testing and that happens if we have a client that is really heavily using information technology the problem being that if that's the case you have that problem of the disappearing audit trail and so there may not be sufficient evidence available to allow you to do a purely substantive approach so you're going to uh, be wanting to test the IT controls and whatnot because you won't be able to do a purely substantive approach. So under those circumstances, yeah, then you may have to move directly, uh, I shouldn't say directly, then you may have to test the operating effectiveness of the controls because you're not going to have the sufficient evidence to allow you to do a purely substantive approach. Okay. Now, when you um, come over, and you take a look at the next page, okay? And they tell us that um, when we will need to perform test of controls, if they use the phrase when to perform test of controls, that, does that mean you have to? That means what? Sometimes you will test the controls, like we said on that little, uh, chart that I gave you, okay, the one with the arrows, okay, so tests of controls are performed when the auditor's risk assessment is based on the assumption that controls are operating effectively, you've assessed the risk of material misstatement to less than the maximum, that means you think the controls are operating effectively, you're going to test them, unless you're doing a purely substantive approach, because it's more efficient, but that's highly unlikely, well, it's unlikely. And number two, when substantive procedures alone are not sufficient, and now they're telling us that's the issue with the information technology that we saw on the previous page. If you want to, you can go ahead and point up to that previous page, okay, in which I went ahead and had just told you that in the IT environment, we flashcarded that there could be a situation where you have to test the controls. Okay, an IT environment, but generally the thing that leads you to the testing of the operating effectiveness is that first one there, the one in the blue, number one, you have assessed the risk of material misstatement less than the maximum. Okay, now they tell us here that some, proceed, some risk assessment procedures may provide evidence of operating effectiveness, even though they were not intended to. What does that mean? Well, you can put down walk through. So what happens? The day that you go to do your walkthrough to see that the control has been implemented, what, okay, you do that. Well, that was the a procedure that was allowing you to see if the control was implemented, which is something that we do in the risk assessment phase. But we can take that one day that we looked at it and put it as part of our evidence that the controls have operating effectiveness. So let's say we decided, well, we're going to look at 50 days worth of transactions to see if the controls have operating effectiveness. Well, if we looked at that one day, then when we start looking at, say, documents like those inventory control sheets that I talked about last time for the jewelry shop, we would only look at, what, 49 more, right? That's what that is saying. Okay, and uh, if it is efficient to do so, you could test the operating effectiveness of the controls concurrently with obtaining the understanding. So even though I'm showing it sort of as, you know, you do this, then you do that, you can combine those things. I'm obtaining an understanding, but at the same time, I've determined this is the sample size that I'll need to test uh, to support the uh, you know, the level of the, the assessment of the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum as I test the operating effectiveness. And you can do those concurrently. That's generally going to be done with a client that you probably have a, a certain amount of um, familiarity with. 
And so you don't have to spend as much time just obtaining the understanding and making the assessment. You pretty much know what your assessment is going to be. And then you're really doing the testing to make sure that things haven't fallen apart, you know, from whatever your observations were in a previous audit. Now we come down and let's take a look and let's flashcard this guys, even though we've said this a number of times, the auditor is required to obtain the understanding of the design and implementation of internal control as part of the understanding. The auditor is not required to evaluate the operating effectiveness as a part of the obtaining the understanding of the design and implementation. Again, as you're doing that, if you make the assessment of the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, then you may bypass the testing of the operating effectiveness. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and they talk about the nature of our test of controls. Okay. And when they talk about the nature here, they say, well, you could look at this and they're going from least persuasive to most persuasive inquiry being the least persuasive, then observation, then inspection, and re-performance is the most per, uh, co uh, convincing uh, way to, um, to look at the testing of the internal controls. Note that inquiry alone is not sufficient, and observation is generally pertinent only to the time that the observation is made. That's why you will pull a sample of transactions and look to see that that control had operating effectiveness. So observation just works for that day that you're there, but you're going to want to see is there some evidence that will allow me to see that that control is consistently applied throughout the year, and you're going to probably get to that through going through and doing some inspection of documents. Reperformance is the most convincing because what you do is you put yourself in the client's position and see if you believe that that control procedure would be effective in preventing or detecting the misstatement in that assertion. Remember that sales chart, I'm not going to put it up again, but remember we said that we participated in a few calls when they make the calls with the clients, we actually got on and we made a few calls and that's a re-performance. Now you're getting a real feel, you're getting a direct personal knowledge as to how that control is working. And that is going to be the best evidence that you can have as to how effective you think that control is. But you would need to combine it with some of these other things like the inspection, the observation. Inquiry is probably how we obtain the understanding, but inquiry alone is not sufficient to give us a lower assessed level of control risk. Now, um, what I did with that listing there, because um, I wanted it to be more of a feeling of a hierarchy. So what I did was I put to this little thing here, okay? And uh, when we look at this, notice re-performing is at the top of the pyramid. Inquiry is at the bottom of the pyramid, okay? Now remember, if I assess my risk of material misstatement at, say, minimum, that means when I do my control testing, I'm going to need larger samples for my control testing. And I'm probably going to be looking for stuff that's what? More towards the top of this chart, like re-performance, inspection, et cetera, right? If I am sitting there and I have assessed the risk of material statement at a little higher level, eh, I can probably have smaller sample size for my control testing and I don't have to do as much re-performance. If I assess my control risk of the maximum, how much of this do I do? Well, I probably did the inquiry because that's how I figured out that the control wasn't any good. And I didn't move up through inspection and observation and whatnot. Okay, question. Okay, good. Now you come down over to back to the textbook. Well, this is uh, interesting. Do I have a typo on mine? Inquiries, observation, inspection. So what did I do? Mess my chart up? Looks like I did, right? Because inspection is higher than observation, right? 
That's what I get for trying to be too smart. So number one is number one is um, reperformance. Number two, they said, is what inspection. Somebody help me with that. Is that right? Yes, inspection. Yeah. Number three is observation and the least reliable is inquiry. Sorry about that. Note to self, I got to fix that. Those should be flipped. Okay. Okay, good. Come over. Sorry. That's good. That could be a little confusing there. So saying one thing in the book and I got something else there, but they're they're correct in the book. Okay, all right, good. Now, um, let's come down and take a look at evidence obtained in prior audits, okay? And here they tell us that <clears throat> if controls have changed since they were last tested, they must be tested again. Controls that have not changed would have to be tested every third year okay now that every third year guys is a um it's a minimum not a maximum okay so it's not like they can sit there and say well wait a minute hold on the controls haven't tested ha haven't changed and you tested them last year so you can't test them this year the auditor could choose to test them every single year what they're telling you is that a what at a minimum you must test them every third year. You could test them more frequently if you want to, but if they haven't changed since year one, you wouldn't have to test them in year two, year three. By year four, yeah, you would have to test them because now you're into your third year. Okay. Okay, good. So flashcard those two things about how frequently you have to test them. And basically, the reason they headed that evidence obtained in prior years, you can rely on what you've learned in the past and you know that your client is pretty good. And so you're sitting there and say, okay, I don't have to test these every single year. Now, obviously you wouldn't do that the first year and you audited them because you don't have that previous experience. Maybe by year two, you see that they did a good job in year one. Year two, maybe you decide to test them again, right? Maybe by the third year, you say, well, now I'm not going to test them. And then you'd be on that three-year cycle before you have to test them again, unless they changed. And frankly, using auditor judgment, you can test them as frequently as you want. Okay, good. Now you come over and results of the uh, test of controls, okay? And once we have tested the controls, we can conclude that the control has operating effectiveness. It can be relied upon. And now the what? Timing, extent, and nature of my substantive procedures, nature, ex, uh, internal evidence instead of external, sample size, a smaller sample size, timing, interim testing instead of year end, not operating effectively. Now I've done the testing and I found, hey, they did not have operating effectiveness. When I looked at those inventory control sheets, they weren't signed off on. When I looked to see if the supervisor signed off on a time card, it wasn't signed off on. So I could test alternative controls, or I will just go ahead and make my assessment of my risk of material misstatement at high. And I will now alter my timing, extent, and nature of my substantive procedure using external evidence, larger sample sizes for my substantive testing, and doing year end instead of interim. Okay, so go ahead and flashcard how you will respond to the results of the control. Okay, now when we talk about our substantive test, guys, and we've said this a number of times, there are two types of substantive tests, test of details and substantive analytics. And again, as I've drawn here a couple of times, I guess I'm following a little, my own little drawing here, most of our procedures for our substantive procedures. If this is substantive procedures, right? This rectangle is substantive procedures. Most are going to be test of details. For example, sending out confirmations. accounts receivable 
Okay, that's going to be most of our uh, substantive procedure, but we can do substantive analytic procedures. Okay, that's what I'm trying to articulate there. I'll call them analytical review procedures, whatever, ARP. Okay, and for some assertions, those analytical review procedures will work better for us. Okay, now the timing. Okay, we talk about nature, extent, timing. Okay, we've talked about that and that, but let's get a little more, um, you know, information from the book about timing. Okay, I think extent is obviously using larger sample sizes, but let's take a look at timing. And if substantive procedures are performed at an interim date, the auditor should perform further substantive procedures. Um, to provide reasonable basis for extending the audit conclusion to period end. That's that roll forward. For example, when we were on the audit of the uh, public debt, we did our testing at interim, but then we went ahead and we did analytical procedures that would, because debt is pretty much issued uh, consecutively, um, you know, not consecutively, but consistently, throughout the year, we just went ahead and said, well, if this was three quarters of information, by the time you get to the year end, the public debt should be, and we just extended that forward. And then we compared that expectation, the actual results, and we were good with that roll forward. Okay. So when you do that, um, you could do a substantive analytical procedure to be used to extend audit conclusions from interim um, to the year end. But you have to be, you know, reasonably uh, certain that that year-end balance is uh, predictable. Okay, so you want to be careful about that. It's got to be something predictable if you're going to use an analytical procedure to extend forward. Okay, but you do have to do some sort of roll forward from the. You just can't close your eyes and swing. Say, well, I did my testing in the interim and nothing bad happened by the end of the year. You can't do that. You have to do something to substantiate that um, you're comfortable with that last part of the year uh, if you're choosing interim testing, okay? Now, if, if misstatements are discovered at the interim date, you're having an, oh, you know what moment, because now you're like, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Everything was fine in the interim, and now we've got this car wreck towards the end of the year. What the hell? Well, now you're gonna probably have to go back and do a lot more detailed testing for that last part of the year to figure out what the heck went wrong, particularly if you're doing an analytic and it doesn't work, you're not able to just say, oh, well, it didn't work, so let me change my expectation or something. Now you're going to have to dig down and find out what the heck's happening here. Why did, that, why did you not meet your expectation for your role forward, whatever it was? Okay, good. So let's come over and let's take a look at, and this question we will come back to they misplaced this question, so we'll do this later, maybe next time. We'll do this question next time because I don't know why they stuck it here. This is not where this question belongs. So somebody remind me next time we'll go through this question together. They misplaced it, okay? But we should be able to go ahead and answer question two right now. There's no reason you should be able to answer question one at this point. I don't know why they put that there.
Okay, um, looks like most of us have had a chance to answer this one. And um, okay, um, so 86% of us got this correct, which is great. I mean, this is the kind of questions you're absolutely going to see on the exam is critical uh, to your success on passing the exam. Okay, now. Uh, let's go ahead, though, because it is so important, even though most of us got it right, a good chunk of us got it right, but let's just take a look at this. And so after performing risk assessment procedures, an auditor decided to perform test of controls. So let me ask you this. If the auditor decided, uh, I'm asking not to perform test of controls, if the auditor decided not to perform test of controls, what does that potentially mean? Control risk is pretty low. If you decided not to test the controls? Yes. Okay, so you're saying to me that my IR times my CR, right? In other words, my RMM, you're saying that it was low, so the auditor is not going to test those controls to get some evidence that the controls have operating effectiveness? Um, yeah, I mean, the, I'm saying the risk of the control risk. Um, so let me, let me get this straight. For. Let me get this straight. So you're saying to me that you look at the design of the control, right? And you determine that the control has been implemented. So you think the control is pretty good, right? Yes. Okay, so now you're not going to test to see if the control has operating effectiveness? Well, I would, but I'm just saying if an auditor didn't, it would be, you know, a reason. You wouldn't, but if an, what are your, what, are, what is I, I would still I test, I it. would still test the controls, but if an auditor didn't test the controls, I think the most likely be driving I, drunk. Yeah, that but auditor I think would be that auditor would be derelict in their duty. That auditor would not be following standard. If you evaluate the design of the controls and you've determined that they have been implemented, okay, that's in the risk assessment procedures. After performing risk assessment procedures, after you perform risk assessment procedures which is step one, you do the risk assessment procedures, you obtain an understanding of the design and the control, and you make an assessment of the risk of material misstatement. If you assess it at less than the maximum and you think it's low, you follow the black arrow and you are to, you must first test the operating effectiveness, then do your substantive testing. If you assess the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, then what's happening is you can go straight to substantive testing. You don't have to test the operating effectiveness. So in that question that we were looking at, I asked if you decided not to perform the test of controls, it's not because the auditor had assessed the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum. They likely have assessed it at what? At the maximum, right? Okay. What do you mean, okay? Do you understand it? Yeah. Okay. Well, you you, you got to understand, we're here to understand this. We're not here to win an argument. We're here to understand this. Do you understand it? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Now, what happens? We come over, and with that understanding, let's take a look at the choices. So, A... The available evidence obtained through test of controls would not support, it's not going to support an increase level because by this, if you decided not to test it, the potential is that the control risk is at the maximum already. So you're not looking for an increased level. So that's nonsense. B, a reduction in the assessed level control is justified for certain financial statement assertions. No, we just understood that if you have decided not to test the controls, the potential is that you have determined that there is not the potential for reduction in the assessed level of control. You look at C and it says, it would be inefficient to perform tested controls. That's that one that I had you highlight in yellow. 
that is saying, hey, I'm saying that's not very likely to happen. But if you've determined that even though you looked at the controls, you liked the design, you saw that they're implemented, you think you've got an assessment of the risk and material statement at less than the maximum, that you choose not to test the controls and go directly to substantive testing, because now you're going to be having to get a lot of external evidence, having to do larger sample sizes for your substantive testing, and you're going to probably have to do your testing at um, year end instead of interim. So yeah, that's the correct answer. D, the assessed level inherent risk exceeded the assessed level control risk. So what? If IR is one and CR is say 0.5, that means that what? That means that my RMM is lower than if what? if they were both sitting there at one. So that again is indicating that you think that there is a lower assessed level of risk of material misstatement and you probably would want to test the operating effectiveness of the controls unless the only possible answer is C, you had determined that it was more efficient to go directly to substantive testing, which again, I'm telling you is highly unlikely. Question. Okay. All right. That's the way you need to be looking at that stuff, guys. Now, what I want to do is I want to come back to um, module one, okay? Because I've said that we talk about audit risk, but really fraud risk is a subset of my overall fraud, uh, overall audit risk. So I'm not sure why Becker chose to flip the order here, but I'm gonna do the order that I wanna do here, which is to go ahead and start to talk about fraud risks now, okay? Because we say that we are doing the procedures, the risk assessment procedures, the further audit procedures, our testing of the operating effectiveness potentially, and always our substantive testing. We're doing that to support our conclusion that financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud, right? So misstatement is the big thing. But now we're going to start to look at what happens if we think instead of an unintentional misstatement what if the misstatement is intentional okay so fraud is defined as something that what a misstatement that was caused by an intentional act whereas for error it is unintentional okay now when we talk about these intentional acts this fraud okay there could be fraudulent financial reporting which is basically lying, putting information down, putting that a sale occurred, existed when in fact it did not, okay, and doing that intentionally. And then misappropriation of assets is stealing, right? Stealing cash or whatever. Now, the way they kind of break the risk factors as they um, relate to fraud, they break them into three potential types of risk factors, okay? And I want you to flashcard the three fraud risk factors. There is incentive and pressure, which is a reason to commit the fraud. Hmm, incentive. If I show a bigger net income, um, I'll get a nice bonus. That's an incentive to engage in what? Probably fraudulent financial reporting. Uh, if I don't show a net higher net income, I'm gonna get fired, pressure to engage in fraudulent financial reporting. Opportunity is a lack of the effective internal controls. This often will lead to what? Misappropriation of assets. Gee, they're not really periodically counting up the computer equipment that they have given to their employees and reconciling that to the physical records. So let me steal this computer because they've lost track of it, all right? Opportunity. Rationalization attitude can often lead to misappropriation of assets because the person says, you know, I've worked here 30 years. You've never appreciated my efforts. I'm a hard worker. Let me steal $10 million or something. And the person rationalizes. Attitude really is generally a bad attitude. And it often is a bad attitude by who? By a dominating manager. 
dominating manager will sit sit there and say, oh, I'm the owner of this business and you don't have to do that internal control. So they override the controls, okay? Now, when you look at these fraud risk factors, what is the risk we're uh, concerned about? What risk are you concerned about? As an auditor, huh? As an auditor of financial statements, what risk are you worried about? What risk are you afraid of? Detection risk. Okay. Well, I'm assuming that detection risk is something that you, uh, maybe you're calling that out because with fraud, there's an uh, increased um, concealment aspect, which will make detection more difficult. But as an auditor of financial statements, what risk are you concerned about and then that you're going to respond to and you're on the right track, Gary? What risk are auditors afraid of? Fraudulent financial statements. In general, what risk are auditors afraid of? Material misstatement. Good. Auditors are afraid of the risk of material misstatement. That's our whole problem. There's a risk that there'll be a misstatement and we won't find it. Right. And so we try to mitigate that risk of material misstatement through our what? By lowering our detection risk and increasing our substantive testing. Right. Okay. Now, if we're afraid of risk of material misstatement by error, that's one thing. But if you're thinking it's going to be caused by fraud, then you might look to see how these fraud risk factors drive up that RMM so that you're aware of those and you can respond appropriately. Okay. So if you start to look at these and we start to look at the RMM, RMM is a factor of what? How do we define RMM? Control risk times inherent risk. Good. IR times CR. So it must be that if we're looking at these fraud risk factors and when we see them, that gets the auditor concerned that this the material misstatement is being caused by fraud, then I guess we might want to look to see how these fraud risk factors affect, affect inherent risk and control risk. So if it's incentive and pressure, it says incentive and pressure. You can probably tell where I'm writing it. What do you think? Probably gonna affect inherent risk, right? Right, they're gonna well, probably wanna make the transactions a little more complex and whatnot so that we don't see what they're doing with their bias on their estimates and that kind of thing, right? Okay. Now, if it's opportunity, and you kind of saw that in the uh, outline there, they're telling us opportunity is what? Because there's lack of controls. So opportunity is affecting the control risk. Okay. How about rationalization? I like to call it a rat attitude. How about rationalization attitude? What do you think? I think affecting both. Yeah, I'm thinking it's both. I'm thinking, hey, it could hit what the inherent risk and that somebody, you know, starts to make the transactions more complex or keeps more cash on hand or something like that. Of course, that could also be considered control risk or if it's a dominating management saying override the control. So it probably can affect both. OK, the takeaway from here, guys, because this down here is more of an art than a science. OK, the idea here is that when you're looking at and this is why I wanted to talk about audit risk first. When you're looking at these fraud risk factors, you're not looking at them in a vacuum. You're saying, how do they affect the risk of material mistake? OK, OK, good. Now you come over and flashcard those fraud risk factors. OK, and then you come over. And let's see what the auditor's responsibility is as it relates to fraud and in expressing an opinion 
the auditor provides reasonable assurance. It says in the opinion you've memorized, reasonable assurance that the statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by errors are, and now we're going to see how we're going to consider fraud part of that whole, whole overall uh, auditor's responsibility. Okay, so you come down and when we look at the auditor's responsibility, the auditor has a responsibility to plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement. And as part of the audit planning, the auditor must specifically assess the risk of material misstatement of the financial statements due to fraud. Okay, so what they're saying to us is, look, we've already told you, you have to assess the risk of material misstatement. We've told you that, and we've seen how we document that and how we responded. Now, auditor, we're saying, we want you to call out specifically, how did you consider the risk of material misstatement as it could be caused by fraud? In other words, did you see those fraud risk factors? Did you see them affecting the risk of material misstatement? And did you respond accordingly? Okay, now, Management is responsible for designing, implementing programs to prevent. Okay, so notice here, guys, you want to start thinking about this from the standpoint of an auditor. It is what? It is reasonable assurance, and it is management saying that they'll put programs in place. Nowhere in here is it saying that it's somebody's responsibility to prevent, detect fraud. The problem is, is that fraudulent schemes are very difficult to figure out and to get a handle on. So we are supposed to do our job seeing the fraud risk factors, seeing how they drive up the risk of material misstatements, seeing that we respond accordingly. But because there's collusion and all kinds of concealment aspects that go along with fraud, we tell everybody it's reasonable assurance. And all management can do is put programs in place. It's all a prayer. Please, God, let all this work. And we don't find ourselves the victim of, um, you know, name a fraudulent, a fraudster here that's gotten away with stuff. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come down and... Um, Let's take a look at the audit procedures that we're going to be doing in order to allow us to provide that reasonable assurance that financial statements are free of material misstatement caused by fraud. And um, I want you to flashcard these because this is pretty good. This is a high level discussion of the things that we'll be seeing some more detail on in a couple of minutes. Okay. By the way, guys, be ready for a lot of flashcards here because this is a 10 point area in and of itself, right? Okay, so we will di discuss fraud risk management with the engagement personnel. What we'll do is we'll hold a brainstorming meeting that will say, hey, how could something fraudulent happen here, right? Obtain information to identify specific fraud risk. We're going to want to obtain information that allows us to see if we have the incentive and pressure, the opportunity, the rationalization, the bad attitude. Assess fraud risk and develop the appropriate response. We will literally have to say the risk of material misstatement due to fraud is high, medium, low, whatever it is, we have to document that, okay? Then we have to uh, respond. Then we will go ahead and do our audit procedures, evaluate the audit evidence regarding fraud, make appropriate communication about fraud, document the auditor's consideration of fraud, which I just told you the audit procedures, and then we're going to see specifically what needs to be documented. This is a high-level discussion, but we're doing our work in a manner that we've already described, but we're doing it with what? Fraud on the brain, thinking about those fraud risk factors and how they could lead to fraudulent financial reporting or uh, misappropriation of assets, okay? Now, we're going to go through and we're going to start to talk about each one of these now. Okay, so here's that required discussion amongst engagement personnel. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to um, I don't think I have the flashcard here. Okay, but let's just take a look at what the discussion should include. So you're going to bring the team together, and there'll be a brainstorming 
And part of that brainstorming will be how, where the financial statements might be susceptible to material misstatement due to fraud. Um, I was on an assignment where we were looking at the cash disbursement cycle for the federal government. We led that work out of San Francisco uh, because across the country, there's five regional finance centers that disperse all federal funds. And back in that time, much of the disbursement was still done by hard copy check. And so you walk into the place and it's basically a factory in which they're just sitting there turning off federal checks. Well, when we get back to our offices, the director, which is like a partner in a CPA firm, um, but they call them directors in government, says, how would you get a check out of that place? He's initiating the fraud discussion, right? And um, I thought, I don't know, it drops in your lunch pail. The guy next to me had it all figured out. Well, here's what you do. You get some blind check stock and da, 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 you get a printer and, and he had it all figured out. It's like, oh, and as a result, of that brainstorming, what we did was we found some susceptibilities for misappropriation of assets, stealing federal checks, and we wrote a limited use report to Congress telling them about the weaknesses we saw. When we say limited use report, that means only Congress can read that because we don't want the public knowing how you could get a check out of the Regional Finance Center, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you one anyway, um, you know, something that we saw which is they were treating, the, the checks come on a spool of 40,000 checks. I mean, it's a huge roll of paper, 40,000 checks. And what they would do at the end of the night, they would just leave that check stock, that giant spool, heavy spool of checks that was sitting on a pallet, they would just leave it out. Because to them, it was just this huge spool of paper instead of following the procedure, which was to do what? Take it and lock it back up in the safe and bring it back out that next day. So there was those kinds of weaknesses that uh, we wanted to communicate to Congress. But the whole thing came out of the brainstorming about fraud and in that case, the misappropriation of assets. So you would talk about how assets could be misappropriated, okay? An emphasis of the um, professional skepticism, right? And I talk about that all the time. If you don't understand something that, you know, the client is telling you, then you keep digging until you've got a full, if it doesn't make sense to you, there's probably something wrong, okay? And then what? Consideration of the risk of management override of controls. That's a big deal. The big problem with the whole Enron thing was not that, you know, <laughs> the people inside the company weren't aware that this was going on. It was that when they blew the whistle, man was saying, get away from me, kids, you bother me, as opposed to doing something about it. They overrode the controls, right? How the auditor might respond to identified fraud risk. And the discussion should involve all key members of the team. And really, it should be led by the partner, we say, including the partner. The partner really should lead that discussion. Okay. All right. Good. So again, we're going through the steps here. Then they say obtain information to identify specific fraud risks. So you come down and you will obtain information by inquiring of entity personnel. And you'll ask about the overall fraud risk identified or suspected instances of fraud. Now, when you ask that question, you don't sit there and go, oh, has fraud ever happened? Because they're going to say no. You would ask the question, say, can you tell us about fraud that has occurred? So they kind of think, oh, okay, they already know about it. So let me tell them about the time that I was pressured to, you know, change some financial report because it was going to, you know, give a bigger bonus or something. Ah, now we got incentive and pressure uh, factors coming in. We've got what? We got a rationalization, a bad management attitude. Okay, we know the fraud risk factor exists by asking that question. Okay. Then you come over and we start to talk a little bit more on the next page, the fraud, uh, uh, the, the information that you're going to be obtaining, what type of oversight the audit committee provides. That's going to obviously be something you're going to ask the audit committee, but you might ask the senior management, management, you might ask the, you know, the supervisors, you might ask their subordinates what they think about the oversight of the audit committee. Okay. Now, 
consider the results of analytical procedures. Now, guys, the last time we said that we have to do a set of planning analytics and we're looking for unusual or unexpected relationships, okay? Now, here's where the fraud standard kicks in because we already said you have to do that, right? But now the fraud standard is kicking in saying, well, we've already told you, you have to do a set of planning analytics to see if anything is unusual. Those planning analytics, as we've said, are done at what? Done at a high level. We've already said that. We said that last time, okay? But now the fraud standard is telling us that we must do a set of analytics over revenue. Why do you think the fraud standard turned it around here and told us that you must do these high-level analytics in the planning phase on revenue? That's when was Because huh? that's where most of them occur. That's where the frauds have occurred, right? So notice, Laura, they're asked, they're telling us to do what they already told us to do, but now under the fraud standard, they start to direct us to areas that we think are going to be more susceptible to fraud. No one ever hears about fraud in the office supplies account, right? So they're directing us to revenue. Good. Now we come down and we then evaluate the fraud risk factors. And let's take a look at that. And they tell us here that if we don't see the fraud risk factors, that is not an indication that fraud has not occurred. It's greatest when all three factors are present, but the existence of all three factors is not an absolute indication that fraud has occurred. And then the opposite, I said it, the opposite is what I'm highlighting now is what I said while I was highlighting the other one. Um, the lack of observation of the fraud risk factors uh, doesn't mean that you don't have fraud, right? I and mean, that's kind of obvious, but flashcard that because that's one of those weird kind of worded things that then they put in a question and it's confusing, but I think that's pretty obvious, okay? Now, after you have identified the fraud risk factors, you need to look at the attributes of the risk. So not attributes of risk are not the fraud risk factors. What are the fraud risk factors? What are the fraud risk factors? Opportunity. Opportunity. Incentive and pressure. Incentive and pressure in rationalization attitude, right? So now what we're doing is we're going to cut those fraud risk factors and see what they're made of. Cut them open and see what they're made of. Okay, so there's a difference between the fraud risk factors and the attributes of those fraud risk factors, and we're going to flashcard those attributes, okay? Type of risk. Does it involve fraudulent financial reporting or misappropriation of assets? Significance of the risk. Can it lead to material misstatement? How significant is it? Is it going to cause a material misstatement, or is it going to cause a two-cent error in the office supply account, right? likelihood of the risk. Look, you can probably sit there all day with the fraud boogeyman whispering in your ear, right? Okay, so you just don't come up with some wild thing. Well, they might jump out of a window with some equipment and nobody will ever see them again. Okay, no. You know, it's got to be something that you think will probably happen. It's likely to happen. How likely is it and how pervasive is it? Will this fraud risk factor affect the entire financial statement, this particular account, whatever? Okay, flashcard those attributes and make sure you realize those are different than the fraud risk factors. Now you come over and presumption of risk, and this is rare for the standards to do. Usually the standard says, do the procedure, tell us what you found. Okay, here they're telling there is a presumption that there will be improper revenue recognition and management override of controls. So what that's telling you is the standards are gonna ask you not to do the procedure and tell us what you found. They're gonna say, what procedure did you do? And tell us why you don't think there's these things. That's a lot different than what the standards usually do. And when you look at improper revenue recognition and management override of controls, can you say Enron? 
this is around the time this broad standard is being updated around the time that we're all gasping, you know, for, for breath for what Enron and WorldCom were doing. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over and you take a look and um, the entities, um, you know, internal control, internal audit function will vary by the size of the company. So we would expect a larger company to have more sophisticated controls than a smaller company. Although frankly, if um, it's a smaller entity and let's say they don't have an internal audit department, but there's a board of directors, my expectation would be that the board of directors would be performing some of those internal audit functions. So there's ways around a smaller company to still get the kind of considerations that we might want a company to have, even if they're not as a large. Now, the susceptibility um, to particular items when there is fraud, and uh, you can see if there's a high degree of subjectivity or a highly complex accounting uh, pr principles that are being used, or if fraud can be concealed, okay, uh, we're going to want to consider those factors in considering the sus susceptibility. Okay, again, I'm of the opinion that the trick that uh, folks would try to pull on you there is they make you feel like you're the problem. You're the inadequate one that isn't understanding the complexity. Well, you're, you know, this is a highly complex, let me explain to you. And they start taking on that tone, slow them down and get them to explain the things to you correctly and not make you feel like, you know, you've got some deficiency in your ability to understand something. Maybe they're the problem, okay? Now you come over, and you take a look at uh, assessing the risk, okay? And the auditor is required to obtain an understanding of the entity and its environment, including its internal control. We've been saying that all night now. And then we are to look at what specific controls that may mitigate specific risk, okay? And then what? we're going to want to look at how those controls will address the risk. And we're looking for now controls that are going to specifically address the risk that we have seen associated with the fraud, potential for fraud. Okay, so again, we're doing the same thing. We're assessing the risk of material misstatement and we're looking at it for assertions and we're looking for controls that would mitigate. And then we're going to go ahead and see that those controls mitigate. But now we're doing it specifically for the potential that there could be material misstatement um, related to fraud. Okay. So now we've gone ahead and we've made our assessment and we need to respond. And we can respond at a general level and we're going to respond at an assertion level. So assigning personnel to the engagement. Okay. Let's see. Who wants to be partner tonight? Who wants to become partner? Come on, guys, we don't have a lot of time left. Who wants to be partner? Nobody? I'll wait. I'm, I'm the only one here that thinks getting paid for this, so I can wait. Okay, I'll tell you what, look at the rest of this information on your own, okay? And the other thing that I want you to do is I want you to look at the ratio um, analysis um, um, module on your own as well, okay? So since you guys seem like you're a little bit tired, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call, it, adjourn the class tonight. Look at the rest of this fraud statute on your own, uh, fraud uh, standard on your own, and then uh, look at the uh, financial ratio section on your own. We will pick up next time with, I think it's going to be um, module four as we start to get into some additional areas, okay? Okay, guys, I will see you next time. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.